Like every other week, this week too, we have two talks. Our first talk is by Dr. Chianing Chao. She would be talking to us about LNO. This is a new neural operator proposed by her, which stands for Laplace Neural Operator that is used for solving partial differential equations. She has obtained her PhD in ocean engineering from Ocean University of China before she spent two years as a visiting student at the University of Rhode Island. Recently, she is a visiting scholar at the Crunch Group at Brown University. Her research interests include uh, focuses on Laplace and frequency domain methods for computing responses and system identification. By incorporating deep learning, a new neural operator called Laplace Neural Operator has been proposed by her for solving partial differential equation and ordinary differential equation. Additionally, she's also interested in promoting neural operators in the domain of ocean engineering. With that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Chianing Chao, and you may want to start. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Qianyin, and I would like to thank Data for hosting this seminar. For the next 40 minutes, I will give a brief overview of the Laplace Neural Operator. It has been a great pleasure working on this project with Data and Professor Kaniodakis. To begin with, I will provide some background and motivation for why this work is necessary. Next, I will address the theory and algorithm of the LNO, followed by three ODE examples and three PDE examples. Finally, I will provide some concluding remarks and future works. Real-world problems in computational science and engineering often lack closer form solutions and need the use of expensive numerical solvers in terms of both processing and the memory. Even minor change to the problem parameters require running the numerical solver again. However, the recent advancements in scientific machine learning, particularly the development of deep neural operators, offer a promising approach to solve ODE or PDE examples using data-driven supervised learning. This approach offers an alternative to traditional numerical solvers. By training a deep neural operator on a sufficiently large and diverse data set offline, it's possible to approximate the solution of an ODE or PDE over a wide range of parameter values very fast online without further training. Deep operator uh, network and the Fourier neural operators are two neural operators that have shown promising results in approximating complex physical processes. Deep Onet was proposed in 2019 by Lulu and co-workers. They extended the universal operator approximation theorem to propose the idea of Deep Onet, which can learn nonlinear continuous operators accurately and efficiently from a relatively smaller data set due to its small generalization error. The architecture of deep O net consists of two DNNs. The branch net encodes the input function at fixed sensor points, while the trunk net encodes the information related to the coordinates. Subsequently, some extensions of the deep O net were proposed, including POD deep O net, uh, self adaptivity deep O net. Deep ONET with history uh, and violet deep ONET. These extensions perform better than their vanilla counterparts in specific problems. Another type of neural operator is guided by the Green's function. It also includes several neural operators, such as graph neural operator, Fourier neural operator, and the violet neural operator. These neural operators have the same architecture, which is shown in figure three. The architecture includes three steps. First, the input function ft is lifted to a higher dimensional representation vt by a linear transformation p. In each iteration, 
the update from UT to UT plus one is defined as a composition of a kernel integration and a nonlinear activation function. For solving this kernel integral operator, different methods were proposed. In these neural operators, the FNO is a promising method. FNO replaces the kernel integral operator with a convolution operator defined in the Fourier space by employing a fast Fourier transform on the input space. The Fourier transform converts a physical system from the time domain to the frequency domain. Due to the use of FFT, the FNO is very fast. Moreover, FNO can achieve a high accuracy with a small size of training samples. However, FNO includes fast Fourier transform, so it assumes the input to be periodic. Furthermore, FNO can only capture steady state responses. To illustrate the performance of these neural operators, I will provide an example here. The left figure is a semi-submersible platform with eight mooring lines. Random waves propagate in the third direction. The computation of the response of this floating structure and the random wave is very complex since it involves two nonlinear operators, namely the hydrodynamic operator and the structural operator. The hy hydrodynamic operator can be viewed as the incompressible Neville Stokes equation, which takes the wave elevation as input and the hydrodynamic coefficient and wave forces as output. The structural operator is defined through the equation or motion of the floating structure, which takes the hydrodynamic coefficient and the wave forces as input and the structural responses as the output. Our objective is to learn a combined operator that integrates the hydrodynamic and structural operators. To that end, the wave elevation is considered as the input and the structural responses are obtained as output. Here, eight neural operators and GRU are used to solve this problem. As shown in figure 4b, the deep O net with history and FNO exhibit excellent performance in this example. And the FNO with a small size of training samples achieves outstanding prediction accuracy. However, as shown in figure 4c, when considering transient response, the prediction accuracy of FNO is significantly reduced compared to uh, capturing non-transient response. For addressing the bottleneck of FNO, we propose a novel architecture that performs operate learning in the Laplace domain for solving ODE or PDEs. Figure five shows a schematic of the proposed neural operator, which replaces the Fourier layers of FNO with Laplace layer. The Laplace layer employs the analytical poor residue operation, providing a more meaningful and physically interpretable mapping between the input and the output space in the Laplace domain. Uh, before discussing the details of the Laplace layer, layer let, us, uh, let us introduce two concepts. One is the Laplace transform, another is the poor residue form. First, we explain the relationship between Fourier transform and the Laplace transform and the advantage of the Laplace transform. For a function ft, its Laplace transform is given by equation one, where the variable s equals lambda plus i omega. So equation one can be rewritten as equation two. As we can see from equation two, the Laplace transform of ft is the Fourier transform of ft times e2 negative lambda t. If lambda is set to zero, 
the Laplace transform becomes the Fourier transform. Fig6 visually represents a system transfer function, where the green surface is the Laplace transform of a function, and the red curve is the Fourier transform of this function. Thus, the Fourier domain is a slice of the Laplace domain, evaluated keeping the real part zero. In figure six, the locations of the peaks, such as points A and B, represent poles, and the magnitude of A and B are the absolute values of the corresponding residues. From a discrete transform perspective, performing a Laplace or Fourier transform is essentially projecting a function onto basis functions. In the Laplace transform, the complex exponential functions are used as a basis function, while in the Fourier transform, harmonic functions serve as a basis. Equations, uh, equation three and equation four are referred to as Pony series and the Fourier series respectively. As we can see from equation four, the Fourier series is composed of many harmonic components, each with a unique frequency. That is integer multiple of the fundamental frequency. On the other hand, the basis of a Pony series comprises complex exponentials. As shown in figure, uh, figure 7a, the basis functions can be purely harmonic, damped harmonic, or purely damped exponential functions. In comparison, figure 7b shows that all basis functions are harmonic. Thus, the Pony basis functions are more flexible and expressive than the Fourier basis functions. Consequently, the signal in the left figure can be easily expressed by only five components, whereas the Fourier series requires more than five. Uh, no matter if it's a Peroni series or Fourier series, they are essentially in poor residue form in the time domain. In the complex plane, a function in its partial fraction form is also called poor residue form, like equation five. Lambda is the poor, alpha is the residue. The poor residue form can be easily transformed among Laplace transform. A uh, Laplace domain, time domain, and the uh, frequency domain. Uh, equation six to eight are the poor residue form in these three domains. As we can see, the equation seven is the Pony series in equation three. When lambda is set to i omega, the equation seven will become the Fourier series in equation four. Till now, we haven't yet introduced the input space, system, and the output space. So the above concepts can be used in every species. After knowing these concepts, let's talk about the proposed LNO. LNO belongs to the second type of neural operators, which includes a lifting operation, the hidden layers, and a projection operation. However, the hidden layer in LNO is the normal Laplace layer. In this layer, the input signal Vt is transformed into Vs in the Laplace domain. The unknown system K phi in the Laplace domain is represented by a neural network. Following the poor residue formulation, the output Us in the Laplace domain can be obtained. Therefore, the poor residue formulation is crucial in the Laplace layer. We will discuss the details of the poor residue formulation next. Our derivation begins from equation 13. By performing the Laplace transform, the convolution integral in equation 13 becomes the product between k phi s and v s. By using decomposition techniques, the kernel k phi s and the input v s 
can be reconstructed into their pool residue form. Writing equation 15 into the pool residue form, the output residues corresponding to the system pool's mu and the input pool's i omega are calculated by the residue theorem. Finally, by, perform, by performing the inverse Laplace transform, the output in the time domain is obtained, as shown in equation 17. In equation 17, the second term of LNO is the steady state response, which corresponds to the overall result in FNO. Additionally, LNO includes an extra term dedicated to the transient response generated by the zero initial conditions. This is the reason why LNO can capture the transient response caused by the zero initial condition. By comparing with FNO, we also find out FNO chooses key phi to be a neural network parameterized by the key phi omega in Fourier space like equation 10. The number of hyperparameters depends on the discretization of the omega, which is related to the input space alpha omega. The LNO also chooses KiFi to be a neural network, but is parameterized by system pooled mu and residues beta in Laplace domain. The network parameters are defined and learned in the Laplace uh, space rather than in the Fourier space or the physical space. The trained system pools and the residues are not related to the input space or the omega. Uh, in this part, we will introduce how to implement the LNO. It includes three main steps. Two linear transformations are used in the first step and the third step. The second step is the main step, which includes six sub-steps. First, we perform the FFT of input VT to obtain input ports I omega and residues alpha. We also can use Pony SS method to decompose the input into the pore residue form. Second, generating the initial system pools and residues to establish the neural network. Third, we obtain the output residues gamma and lambda based on the relationship of pools and residues among input space, system, and output space. Then, by performing the IFFT of lambda, we can obtain the steady state output. And the transient output is obtained by the summation of complex exponential functions. Finally, a nonlinear activation function is introduced. Now let's look at uh, some examples that highlight the proposed method. A viral description of the different benchmarks considered in this part is presented in tables one and two. We consider the total response for the OD examples in table one for investigating the efficiency of LNO in handling transient response. For each experiment, slightly different input functions are considered for the training and testing samples to investigate the generalization ability of the neural operators. To evaluate the performance of the neural operators and GRU, we, ca we ca calculate the relative L2 error of the predictions of the test samples and report the mean and standard deviation of this metric based on five independent training trials. We will introduce each example in detail. The first example is a Duffin oscillator. It's one of the prototype systems of nonlinear dynamics, which has been successfully utilized in model many processes, such as beam buckling and the stiffening springs. The Duffin equation 
is a nonlinear second order differential equations, which can be written as equation 18, where Ft is an external force, M and C are the mass and damping coefficients. K1 and K3 characterize the stiffness of the system, and Ft is the displacement of the dynamic response. Equation 18 is subjected to zero initial conditions. In this example, for simplicity, we have considered M equals one, K1 equals one, and K3 equals one. And we have studied two cases. The first case considers a duffing oscillator that does not include damping. The second case considers a duffing oscillator that includes a damping term with a coefficient c equals 0.5. Here, our goal is to learn the nonlinear operator of the system in equation 18, which maps the forcing function ft to the system, uh, system response xt. To generate training samples to train LNO, we consider a sinusoidal force where the amplitude A belongs to the range from 0.05 to 10 with an interval delta A equals 0.05. Therefore, the number of training examples equals to 200. Each sample is discretized into 2048 temporal points and the time interval is 0.01 seconds. The response is calculated by a OD solver, OD45 in MATLAB. For validating and testing the neural operator, we generate data sets considering a decaying sinusoidal force, where the amplitude A belongs to the range from 0.14 to 9.09, .09, and the number of validation samples is 50 and that for testing is 130. Table three gives the mean value of the relative L2 errors obtained by LNO, FNO, and CRU. The improvement of the prediction of LNO or FNO is more pronounced for oscillators without damping. If the damping of a system is zero, there will always exist a transient response. Remember, LNO features a dedicated transient term compared to FNO. That's the reason why LNO is better than FNO here. LNO is more accurate than GRU when there is no damping, but GRU is more accurate than LNO when the damping term is introduced. Figure 8 shows the error plots of two representative test samples for each of the neural models. The first row shows the damping-free samples, from where we can see the superior performance of the LNO, which induces orders of magnitude lower error over time. On the contrary, FNO and GRU induce large errors whose magnitude increases over time. The damped samples in the second row indicate that the LNO has a better performance compared to FNO, but the GRU induce, induces orders of magnitude lower error. In the second example, we consider a gravity pendulum subjected to an external force Ft. The equation which describes the motion of the pendulum is shown in equation 19, where G is the magnitude of the gravitational field, L is the length of the rod, C is the damping due to friction, X is the angle from the vertical to the pendulum, and Ft is the external force. For simplicity, we have chosen G over L equals one in this example. And these two damping cases in example one are also considered. 
For the driven gravity pendulum model, we consider the same forcing functions for training and testing as used in equation one. Thus, the number of training validation as in testing samples are 200, 50, and 130, respectively. We aim to learn the mapping from the external force to the motion of the pendulum. Table four shows the relative L2 error of the predictions computed by the LNO, FNO, and GRU for both cases. As observed in the previous example, LNO can predict the results more accurately than FNO and GRU for the systems without damping. Equation of uh, figure nine uh, presents the error plots of two representative test samples for each of the neural models. From equation nine, similar model behaviors can be observed. Equation three considers the Lorentz system, which is a mathematical model that simplifies many practical problems, including electric circuits, atmospheric convection. In this case, we study a forced Lorentz system, which has a forcing term. For instance, climate studies can use this system to model the temperature of the atmosphere and oceans as forcing terms. The forced Lorentz system includes three ODEs defined as equation 20, where X is proportional to the rate of convection, Y is proportional to the horizontal temperature variation, Z is proportional to the vertical temperature variation. The terms sigma, rho, and beta are three constant parameters related to the Prandtl number, Rayleigh number, and the specific physical dimensions of the layer, respectively. Even though the equations are simple, the Lorentz system has a chaotic and unpredictable behavior, so it's highly sensitive to initial conditions. The initial conditions in this example are chosen slightly away from the state of no convection. That is, x0 equals 1, or y0 equals 0, z0 equals 0. The sigma equals 10 and the beta equals 8 over 3 are chosen in this example. We consider two cases, namely the really number equals 5 and 10 respectively. The number of samples for training, testing, and validation is kept the same as in the previous two examples. We aim to learn the mapping from the source term Ft to the system response Xt. The results presented in Table 5 demonstrate that LNO approximates the cases 1 and 2 with overall high accuracy. The improvement of the accuracy is more pronounced in the case of row equals 10. From the second row of figure 10, we can observe that the system has uh, two equilibria. One is in five, another is in negative five. LNO is more accurate in systems with multiple equilibria in the responses. For investigating the ability of LNO in learning PDEs, example four chooses uh, an Euler Bernoulli beam, which is written as equation 21. Why, uh, where yxt is the deflection of the beam at the location x and the time t. Fxt is the source term. E and I are the elastic modulars and the second moment of area of the cross section of the beam. Rho and A are the material density and the area of the cross section of the beam. Here, our goal is to learn the operator of the system in equation 21, which maps the source term Fxt 
to the steady state response YXT. To generate training samples to train LNO, we consider an exponential sinusoidal function where the amplitude A is in the range from 0 0.05 to 10 with an interval that A equals 0 0.05. Therefore, the number of training samples is 200. Each sample is discretized into 51 times 17 temporal spatial grid points. For validating and testing the neural operator, another exponential sinusoidal function is considered, where the ampl amplitude is from 1.24 to 10.19. Thus, the number of validation samples and testing samples are 50 and 130. Table 6 shows that the results predicted by LNO have an overall high accuracy than FNO. Figure 11 shows the error plots of two representative test samples. The errors of LNO are more than one order of magnitude smaller than those of FNO. The diffusion equation is a PDE that is applied in many fields, such as information theory, material size, and the biophysics. It's a special case of the convection diffusion equation. The equation is usually written as equation 22, where yxt describes the density of the diffusing material at location x and time t. Fxt is the source term. D is a collective diffusion coefficient for density y at location x. In this case, D equals one is chosen. For learning the operator of the system in equation 22, the following two types of functions are used for training and testing respectively. Each sample is discretized into 25 times 80 temporal spatial grid points. Table 7 indicates that the predictions made by LNO exhibit a higher level of accuracy than FNO. Figure 12 displays error plots for two representative test samples for each neural model. The errors of LNO are two orders of magnitude smaller than those of FNO. It's worth noting that both the Euler Bernoulli beam and the diffusion equation are essentially learning linear operators. By utilizing the linear system to accurately represent the pool residue formulation, the results obtained with LNO in these two cases are considerably superior to those achieved with FNO. The last example considers the reaction dif uh, diffusion system. It can be represented as equation 23, where YST is the concentration of chemical substance or particles at location X and time T. Fxt is the source term, and E is the amplitude of the source term. In this problem, the diffusion coefficient d equals uh, 0 0.01, and the reaction rate k equals 0 0.01. We utilize the neural operators LNO and FNO to learn the mapping from the source term Fxt to the steady state response yxt. To generate training and testing samples, these two types of functions are chosen. Each sample is discretized into 20 times 40 temporal spatial grid points. Table 8 shows that LNO produces more accurate results overall than FNO. Figure 13 displays error plots of two typical test samples. 
LNO has smaller errors than FNO, indicating that using the system pools and residues as network parameters helps in operator learning, even when dealing with the steady state response of nonlinear systems. Figure 14 summarizes the relative L2 error in the test cases for all the ODE and the PDE examples, and for different cases considered in each example. The plot shows the mean and standard deviation of the error that has been computed based on five independent training trials. The results demonstrate that the approximation accuracy of LNO is better than FNO, especially for the Non, uh, no damping system and a system with multiple equilibria. However, GRU is more accurate than LNO when the damping term is introduced. For the linear Euler Bernoulli beam and the diffusion equation, LNO's exact representation of the poor residue formulation yields significantly better results than FNO. For the nonlinear PDE, LNO's errors are smaller than those of FNO, demonstrating the effectiveness of using system pools and residues as network parameters for operator learning. We also summarize the number of hyperparameters of LNO and FNO for all examples. As we can see from table nine, the number of hyperparameters for LNO in each example is significantly smaller than that for FNO. To conclude, a novel architecture, Laplace neural operator, to perform operator learning in the Laplace domain is proposed for solving differential equations. The physically meaningful poor residue relationship between the input and the output is introduced into the network, which makes the operator more interpretable and endows it with good generalization ability. The proposed architecture can learn both transient and st steady state responses and therefore can be easily employed for system without damping. Finally, the proposed architecture can learn system with multiple equilibria. However, the LNO had more expensive computational cost than FNO because it includes an extra, uh, extra transient term. We will try to optimize the code and try to reduce the computational cost. Another problem is LNO demonstrates superior accuracy than FNO for the mapping from source term to the system response. But the accuracy of FNO and LNO are similar when learning the mapping from initial conditions to the system response. How to improve the capability of the LNO in this problem will be one of the future work. It is notable that LNO is a newly born method, and there are still many areas that need further improvement. We will provide a more stable and efficient program in the future. Okay, uh, and uh, that brings us to the end of the presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have questions for the speaker? Oh, yeah. yeah, I have a question. I'm Guanxiong from Brown. Uh, whether LNO has the superior accuracy than FNO when mapping from source term to the system response, but, but, uh, but does not have the better performance when mapping from the initial conditions to responses? Okay, thank you for your ask, uh, asking. Um, our derivation, uh, you can see from this. 
Oh, okay, from here, our derivation begins from the convolution integral. Uh, by using the poor residue operation, the an analytical solutions of the U1T is obtained. Um, when the input is the uh, source term, uh, the convolution integral is physically meaningful. So the uh, relationship between the uh, source term system and the output uh, exactly satisfies the poor residue formulation. So the poor residue formulation uh, works uh, better in this case. However, when the input is uh, initial conditions, the convolution integral in equation 13 uh, does, not, does not have the physical meaning. Uh, so uh, when we use the poor residue formulation, it uh, does not work better than FNO. I think this is maybe the reason uh, we are actually uh, we are actively working on this, and uh, we try to solve this problem in the future. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Chen Xi from Brown. I have a question uh, in the example you're showing. You're, it looks like you use different input uh, function of, of different form for the training and testing data set. Uh, it looks like an astrolation. Could you explain uh, about, uh, why we are doing this? Okay, I'm glad you asked this question. Uh, we set up different uh, input function forms. Uh, it's used to investigate and demonstrate the generalization ability of the LNO. If the uh, input, input function form for the training and testing are uh, same, uh, the ac uh, prediction accuracy of LNO and FNO uh, are very similar. We, also, we are also thinking about uh, how to further investigate the generalization ability of LNO. Yeah, that's, that's the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Edhat, you had some questions? Yeah. Uh, Professor Edhat, you could uh, ask your questions. I just saw you raised your hand. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Omdata. So I thanks a lot for this uh, very nice talk and uh, very very nice slides. I have just a very small question. So you you introduced uh, these non-standard uh, prony series. Yes. Um, uh, so so my idea was that uh, you do this in order to account properly for for the damping of the system. But uh, in the in the end, on the last slide. Uh, you, you you mentioned that it accounts also for for um, for non damping problems. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this you can do already with uh, with with the standard Fourier series. So so I was a bit puzzled that uh, to to my mind this uh, prony approach is for damped systems. I mean to, to include also damped systems. Oh yeah, right? Yes, yes. Prony SS method uh, can decompose the a uh, signal into uh, exponential uh, form or the uh, damped exponential form. It's right. Uh, but here, the Pony SS or the FFT is used to decompose the input uh, function. Uh, for example, for an arbitrary input, uh, it may not have the analytical form in Laplace domain. Uh, for achieve this, we use the uh, Pony SS or the FFT to decompose uh, the input, sem uh, input function to express the input function into poor residue form. That's the reason why we introduce the FFT or Pony SS here. Yes. Yeah. Do I, do I answer your Thanks. question? Yes, that's fine. Thanks a lot. Oh, thank you. Do we have more questions for Chianik?
if not. Um, thank you, Jianning, for the wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sundata. We'll uh, move to our second speaker. Uh, George, uh, George Stefaniantis, if you're online. No, some other thing, he's not he's here. Not yeah. Uh, we wait for a while. Uh... Yeah, I think he's here, yeah. George? Hi, George. Come on. Hi. Hi, uh, thanks for joining in early. Thank you, yeah. So uh, maybe uh, you could share your screen and I introduce you to the audience. Yes. So our second speaker today is uh, George Stefaniantis. He would be talking to us about learning dynamics of complex systems from partial observations. He's a fourth year PhD student at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the Department of Mathematics, co-advised by Professor Philip Rioglit and Professor Jan Dungden. He is also a part of the interdisciplinary doctoral program in statistics through the Institute for Data Systems and Society. His research studies how Statistical and machine learning algorithms could be used to infer and predict systems governed by ordinary and partial differential equations that appear in biology, chemistry, economics, and other fields. Prior to joining MIT, he graduated in 2019 from the University of Washington with a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics and Computer Science, where he performed research on network inference methods in the Department of Applied Mathematics under Professor Nathan Kutz. With that, please join me in welcoming him. You may want to take it away. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, it's, it's very exciting to be here and share my research with you. So today I want to talk about the problem of learning dynamical systems from data when the kind of systems that you study can only be partially observed. So here as a motivating example, uh, we have a neuron that's been optogenetically modified. So this is a, a mouse neuron. And all we record from it from this video is just the average light intensity at a given point in time. So this gives us this very noisy kind of spike train time series shown at the top in orange. And we'd be interested to understand if we can build a simple model of the neural dynamics from this single scalar observation of this uh, multidimensional 
uh, neuron system. So these are the kinds of questions that we're going to be motivated by. Before I begin and talk about our approaches to this problem, I'd like to say this is a collaborative work with Alistair Hastwell and Jan Totes, who are at MIT, uh, Dominic Skinner, who is now at Northwestern, used to be at MIT, and RPI Jorn Dunkel in the math department. Okay, so learning dynamical systems from data is a very large field at this point with various applications. Um, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here when I say that it's an important area. Um, the general paradigm is that you observe some state vector of a dynamical system uh, at some time snapshots t. So you get these measurements of the state vector x, and you try to learn a differential equation of the form x dot equals f of x, where f is some unknown right-hand side function of your ODE. And for the purpose of this talk, I'm really just going to focus on autonomous systems where there is no explicit time dependence in the right-hand side of your ODE. So there have been many different methods for approaching this problem. Some of the earliest methods have tried to learn the right-hand side function f uh, in a sparse basis, such as a sparse uh, polynomial basis. Uh, there have been approaches that have tried to model f uh, as a spatially varying function through kernel methods or Gaussian processes, and of course, very machine learning aligned approaches that have been using neural networks or reservoir computing. So all these approaches are, are very useful and they all have their, their, their benefits and trade-offs. Today, I want to focus on the first group of approaches, which is trying to learn the right-hand side function of an ODE in a sparse polynomial basis. But in particular, I'm gonna to try to show that how to extend some of these ideas to the case when you can't actually observe the full system state X. So as an extreme example, Imagine that we have <clears throat> an n-dimensional system state where we can actually only observe the first coordinate of this uh, dynamical system. So would it be possible to build a predictive model for that first coordinate? And in fact, does that model tell us anything about the true governing equations of this system? Okay, there's kind of two, I guess, polar approaches to trying to model the dynamics of X1. The first one is to try to learn a higher order model just in the coordinate that you have to observe. So the way that you can see that this might be possible is you can take this n-dimensional system and you can remove all of the other variables one at a time. So you could take this first equation, F1, and you could try to solve for X2 in terms of all of the other variables and then substitute it in the, into the rest of the equations. And by doing these kinds of iterative substitutions, you can eventually get X1 just by itself with some higher order derivatives of X1. So there's an algebraic way to actually come from an n-dimensional first order system to a uh, nth order system just in the one variable that you can observe. It's kind of a painstaking algebraic procedure, but in most cases, we actually see that this is possible. Um, so there is a bit of backstory to how people studied uh, these types of higher order models. So actually in the 90s, people were interested in understanding what third order systems actually uh, produce uh, chaotic motion. So this went back to a question that was posed by Gottlieb in 1996, where he essentially took a known chaotic system that was published by Sprott uh, a, a bit earlier. And he said, we know the system is chaotic and now we can do this kind of high school algebra to just find what the dynamics is in X and its higher order uh, derivatives. And we see that it has this third order uh, implicit form. And then he asked what other uh, third order uh, systems just in one variable have uh, lead to chaotic dynamics. And there were some follow-ups to this. So in the same year, uh, Linz showed that the Lorenz model can also be reduced into higher order form in its X coordinate. And it gives you back an implicit equation in X and its higher order derivatives. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and there were some follow-up papers that actually tried to generalize how these reductions work for a more general class of nonlinear dynamical systems. Okay, but this was all focused on um, third order. So one of the things that we're going to also show in this paper is that you can do these kinds of substitutions for more than just three variable systems. Okay, um, and then in the 2000s, people actually started using this idea to try to learn the dynamics of a single variable of a multivariate system. Uh, by trying to learn its higher order form equations. So here, for example, they were trying to understand uh, what the higher order form for the, for the dynamics is of the Z variable of the Rossler attractor. Um, and similarly, there was a paper that tried to do this exact same thing to predict the X variable of uh, the, the Lorenz attractor. 
But the issue with some of these approaches is that most of the time you have in an implicit dynamics in X1 and its higher order derivatives. So that adds some significant complications to actually trying to learn it from data. Um, there have been, of course, approaches um, following kind of the same ideas of, of sparse, uh, sparse learning of ODEs to try to learn sparse implicit differential equations. But in practice, this is quite, this is quite a, diff a difficult thing to do. And in fact, for many of the examples where you try to reduce an n-dimensional system to a higher order equation in one of its variables, you get systems that actually aren't very sparse. So the sparsity assumption usually does not hold, and it's hard to learn these kinds of higher order implicit ODEs in practice. So the kind of completely opposite approach that I want to discuss, which will actually be the focus of the rest of my talk, is instead of trying to learn these higher order models, another idea you might have is just take x1 and append onto it n minus one additional variables, which you don't have um, any observations on, but you hope that if you're able to optimize this model, then these additional fields h2 through hn will help drive the dynamics of x1 to fit whatever data you've collected. So of course, this has been quite a popular approach um, and uh, particularly in the context of data assimilation. So, Usually the way it works is you try to say that I want my dynamics to satisfy some sort of equation, x dot equals f of x comma p, where p is some parameter vector that I need to optimize. And as I learn p, I also want it to fit my data. So I want to achieve some small square loss on my observed samples. So this is kind of the, the one of the forms uh, of data assimilation. And it's been very successful in, in various applications. So for example, uh, in, in this paper from Science, um, they showed that you could actually learn um, the, the dynamics of a fluid by just giving it only uh, a scalar observable of how a dye flows in this fluid and not observing any of the velocities of the fluid or, or the pressure, for example. Uh, there was another paper um, by Mangan at all that, by Ribera at all that showed that you can learn the dynamics of the Lorenz attractor by only giving it two out of the three coordinates using this kind of an approach. So they've been quite uh, quite successful, but today what we're really going to focus on is trying to learn the dynamics of the differential equation in such a way that <clears throat> we actually know that it's exactly satisfied by our model. So what I mean by that is that uh, when you do these types of optimization approaches, you have no guarantees that x dot is actually going to be equal to f of x. So you know that it loosely satisfies a differential equation, but it doesn't do so exactly. So therefore, if you try to simulate your differential equation after you've learned it, you might get all sorts of pathological behavior, like it might be unstable. Okay, so I've just discussed these two different approaches to the problem. Um, the first approach where you try to learn a higher order model is nice because usually you have a unique higher order ODE that describes the dynamics of the observed coordinate. But as I said, these ODEs are hard to integrate, they're implicit, they're usually not sparse. So they're really not very amenable to learning. This second approach that I mentioned is very nice because it's simple to integrate, it's usually explicit and you can get a sparse model back. But the issues are that uh, in this particular representation, this ODE model is not unique. So for example, you could permute any of the hidden fields or you could multiply them by scales or flip their signs and you would still get an identical dynamical system back that re could reproduce the exact same dynamics in X1. So that's just an issue with this type of representation that we're gonna have to deal with down the road. Okay, so I'm gonna focus on this second approach. And in particular, what I'm gonna look at are uh, first order multivariate models of a polynomial form. So here we're gonna have all the interactions between the observed field X1 and the hidden fields up to some maximum degree. And the parameters of this model that we're gonna to have to optimize are the initial conditions of all of these variables, the time scales that allow some variables to evolve faster than others, and the coefficients in front of the polynomial terms. So of course, in order to make this parameterization well posed, during the course of optimization, we enforce that the sums of squares of the coefficients are very close to one. Otherwise, you could just multiply the time scales back into the coefficients, which uh, we want to optimize the time scales separately. Okay, so the general kind of uh, pipeline that we're going to follow is we're going to be given um, maybe just a couple of periods of some noisy data. Then we're going to optimize all of these parameters of the model to fit this data. 
And then we're going to make sure that outside of the training window where we fit the model, uh, the predictions of the model continue to do what we expect them to do. So for example, if we expect periodic motion, then we would expect that outside of the training window, the model continues to oscillate. Okay, so how do we actually learn these models? So we learn them using sensitivity methods. Um, and this kind of goes back to what I was saying about learning models that are provably stable um, during the process of training. So sensitivity methods are very useful because they allow you to do this. So how does it work? Well, you have, let's say you have some general loss function. So here we have a loss that combines the square loss on your data. How closely does your first field of your model fit the data that you've observed? And a regularization term. So here we're enforcing that the model that we learned should be sparse. So it should contain few polynomial terms on the right-hand side. Uh, in general, you could have any other loss function, but let's assume that you have this type of a loss. And you want to use any sort of a gradient descent method, such as uh, add a belief, add a grad, um, any approach to essentially optimize this model. So the main question is how do you actually compute the gradient of the loss with respect to your model parameters? Okay, so the first thing that you can do is just differentiate your loss with respect to these parameters. And just by chain rule, you get this expression on the top right. Uh, but the tricky term here is the gradient of the simulation of the first field of the model with respect to your parameter vector P. So the question is, how do you actually uh, compute this quantity? Well, so in the bottom right here, I've rewritten our full uh, differential equation model in its general form. And now what you can do is you can take the derivative of each one of these variables of our system with, res with respect to the parameter vector P. So now this gives you a, a larger N by P uh, system of equations. And you can actually see that if you simulate the system forwards in time, you can actually compute the gradient of X1 with respect to P and then plug it back into your formula for the gradient of the loss function. So this is sometimes called the forward sensitivity method because you take your original system, you append onto it this new system of N times P equations and you do a forward solve and you are able to compute the gradient of your loss with respect to the ODE parameters. Okay, so that's just a general overview of how we optimize our model. So now in practice, I want to show how this works on the simple example of the Fitzunogumo oscillator. So this is like a very prototypical model of uh, neuron spike trains or neuron excitations. So it has this particular form on the bottom left. It's a two variable system where you have a cubic nonlinearity in the first equation. So what we did is we simulated the system for three periods with 30% additive Gaussian noise. And then we tried to fit a two variable polynomial model such that the dynamics in the V coordinate fits the data. Okay, so this is what happens when we take a dense cubic polynomial model. So you see in the first equation, we have all terms up to cubic nonlinearities and likewise in the second equation. So we run gradient descent until the uh, simulations of our model fit the data quite nicely until it converges. And we see that we've learned a pretty dense polynomial model, right? There's many terms on the right-hand side. So classically kind of inspired by this approach from the original Cindy paper, uh, we can cut out all of those coefficients which are below a certain threshold and repeat the gradient descent optimization. So this gives us a slightly more sparse model with also quite a nice fit to the data. So we repeat this over and over until we get to a very sparse model such that if we removed any more coefficients from the right-hand side, we would not be able to re-optimize the model uh, to converge. So this is essentially where the sparse iterative thresholding uh, procedure ends. And now we can actually look at what is this sparse polynomial model that we've gotten back. So here on the left, I've written out again, the true equations of the Fitzsimons system. And on the right, I've written out um, the equations that we've learned through the sparse iterative thresholding procedure. And what we actually see is that they're quite different from each other, right? There's a V cubed term in the W dot equation, which doesn't appear in the true system. And this is to be completely expected because we had no observations of the second coordinate of the Fitzsimons system. So how do we actually show that what we've learned aligns quite closely with the true Fitzsimons oscillator? Well, what you can do is this high school substitution that I talked about at the beginning, you can take W in the first equation for uh, the Fitzsimons system. Um, and you can solve for it in terms of V and V dot and plug it into the second equation for W dot. And if you do that, that gives you this true reduced equation that's shown on the bottom left. 
So this is the true second order dynamics of the v-coordinate of the Fitzhugh-Gumel system. And likewise, you can do this exact same substitution for the system that we've learned. Take w in the first equation, solve for it in terms of v and v dot, and plug it into the second equation for w dot. And again, you get a second order equation uh, just in v. And now you can actually see that the second order system that we've learned and the true second order system are quite close to each other, uh, keeping in mind that we learned this with 30% out of Gaussian noise. So now this kind of brings a circle, uh, it, it kind of completes the circle that we use this first order multivariate form to learn our model, but then we use this higher order representation to actually compare the model that we've learned to the ground truth that we expect it to get. Okay. And there's actually another way to see that the model that we've learned is very close to the true Fitchinogumo system, and this is by showing that it's actually a diffeomorphism of the true Fitchinogumo coordinates. So what do I mean by this? So here's the general uh, parametric form of the Fitchinogumo equations. And let's say that we take this kind of a diffeomorphism, where specifically it's leaving the observed field of our model unchanged because we don't want to change its dynamics, but it is allowing you to change the um, unobserved field. So here we're taking essentially just a linear transformation where alpha and beta are some free parameters. So if you choose alpha and beta exactly in the right way, then you can actually arrive at a new model which has a different sparsity structure. And in fact, it has one less term than the true Fitzhugh-Nogumo system. So it's actually a sparser model than the true Fitzhugh-Nogumo equations. Um, and the reason why I wrote this one out in particular is because you can actually see that this sparsity pattern that you get for the new transformed system is exactly the sparsity pattern of our learned model. So this is just to say that um, another way of viewing that you've discovered the correct dynamics for the coordinates that you can observe is by saying that the model that you've learned is related by a diffeomorphism to the original equations. Okay, so now kind of where does this lead us? Um, well, naturally what this means is that there are actually many sparse polynomial ODEs which lead to the same dynamics in the observed coordinates. Um, okay, so this means that this problem is actually quite not unique, right? So learning a sparse polynomial ODE actually has many equivalent global minimizers due to all of these diffeomorphisms that relate them to the true ground truth model. Now, in addition to these global minimizers, which are actually good to land in because they mean that you've learned the correct dynamics, there's also a lot of spurious local minima, and they come about for many reasons, sometimes because your polynomial basis is too large. So maybe you can replace a V cubed in your model with a V to the fifth, and it's still going to fit your data quite well. Um, another reason is that sometimes your system can actually be approximated by a much simpler lower order dynamics and the ground truth equations that you're trying to learn are actually more complicated than they need to be. Um, and of course, another very important reason is that sometimes the trajectories that you've collected um, are way too noisy or they're non-descriptive. So they converge to a fixed point, but you haven't actually collected the dynamics in the interesting chaotic or periodic regions that you should have. Okay, but as we've seen from various works, even going back to the original uh, Cindy paper and, and many of these sparse learning papers, if you have an overspecified basis, such as a polynomial basis with many degrees, model inference still tends to be possible because of the fact that we promote sparsity by adding in L1 regularization or through procedures like sparse iterative thresholding. Usually by promoting this kind of sparsity structure, we can land in um, a good model that is actually equivalent and correctly describes the dynamics um, of the system. Okay, so now I actually want to shift away from sparse iterative thresholding and talk about the final approach that we've been using to learn the dynamics of partially observed systems. So the reason why sparse iterative thresholding becomes tricky when you can only observe a subset of coordinates of a multivariate system uh, is because, well, sometimes what ends up happening is you do this sparse iterative procedure where you cut out the terms with small coefficients, but then you get stuck at a model which is still not sparse enough. There's still too many terms on the right-hand side. And if you were to remove any other term from this model, uh, the model would diverge or you wouldn't be able to refit it to the data. So this tends to happen um, relatively regularly. Another thing that can happen, which is uh, sort of surprising is that sometimes you can reach a sparse model that you really like, that fits your data very well, but you actually 
if you take the coefficients of this model and you reset them to some random Gaussians and try to refit them to your data, you won't be able to fit them again. So sparse iterative thresholding takes a very particular route where it optimizes your model, thresholds, re-optimizes, and this pathway is what led you to fit your data. So if you try to reset the coefficients to something random and refit them, it might not be able to actually fit your data again. So this model in some sense is not shareable. You can't give it to a practitioner and let them work with it. Um, and another point which I'll discuss in further slides is that sparse thresholding, it relies uh, very heavily on the, on the relative magnitude of coefficients. So how large a coefficient is compared to um, the rest. But what it really can't capture is the variation or um, how varied a coefficient is around its mean. So if you took a model and you were able to fit it, let's say 100 times, would you see a widespread in this coefficient in front of a polynomial term, or would it be very well concentrated around its mean? So sparse of thresholding, it doesn't really take these kinds of notions into account, which are very useful for being able to um, choose which terms you want to keep. Okay. So that leads me to uh, our main approach for actually solving this problem. And I'm gonna show it on the example, again, of the Fitchino-Gumo oscillator. The idea goes as follows. So start with, let's say, several hundred um, dense cubic polynomial models um, in two variables and re-optimize them from just random initial conditions, random coefficients, until they fit your data. So now you can take this whole bag of different models. You can remove all of the models which have the incorrect dynamics. So maybe they didn't fit your data or they diverged. And then cluster the remaining models that have a nice fit to the data and look at the largest model cluster that remains. So here on the next slide, I've actually plotted what happens if you take the uh, simulation, some, just some noisy data from the V-coordinate of Fitzhino-Gumo, and you try to fit uh, several hundred cubic polynomial, uh, cubic polynomial models to this data. So if we take the top cluster that remains after we've thrown out all the bad models, what you actually end up seeing is that there are certain polynomial terms whose coefficients are very well concentrated around their mean and certain polynomial terms whose coefficients are quite washed out. So in particular, in the first equation for V dot, we see that in this bag of several hundred models, the coefficients in front of one V and H and V cubed are very well concentrated. And likely in the H dot equation, the coefficients in front of one V and H are very well concentrated. So what you can do is you can actually rank these coefficients based on their mean divided by the standard deviation uh, from this heat map, which is also known as one over the coefficient of variation. And if you do this, you actually see that the terms with the largest score end up being the correct terms that appear in the true Fitzhugh-Gumo equations. So really what this allows a user now to do, the reason why we formulated the procedure in this way is that essentially you can go down this list where in this uh, table in orange, we've ranked each term that appears in the order of uh, its score. So the first term is the most important, the second term is the second most important, et cetera, et cetera. So you can go down this list and include one term at a time, which will give you a better and better fit to your observed data. And then the user is allowed to decide where they want to stop, where they want to choose a cutoff, where they stop including terms. And that will be the final model that they arrive at. So in particular here, if you stop at um, the seventh term, then you get exactly the true Fitzhugh-Gumo equations. So the last thing I wanna do is I wanna show this on two experimental examples. So here we have um, actual experimental data from spike trains collected from squid axons. So what we did is we fit a two variable uh, cubic polynomial model in V and H, where the first field V was fit to three different squid axon spike train recordings. So we learned a sparse polynomial model using this kind of procedure that I just described. And in particular, you can see that across these three examples, the coefficients of the model that we learned uh, vary quite gradually. So um, they're quite consistent across the three experiments. Okay, so this was just the first example. Of course, with neuron models, there are various two-field, two-variable neuron models in the literature, and most of them are not of a polynomial form. They usually have some sort of an integrate and reset feature. So it was kind of hard to say that the polynomial models that we were learning uh, could be exactly compared to the models that exist in the literature. So the next example that I want to show, they're actually 
is some intuition behind the model that we've learned. So here, this experiment is a, a chemical reaction called the bellows of Zhepotinsky reaction. So the way that it works is you have something on the order of 30 chemical species that interact with each other, and they eventually change the color of this chemical solution from red to blue in this oscillatory way. So what we did is we generated three chemical experiments uh, of this form with uh, different parameters. And again, we learned a two variable polynomial differential equation that could in its first coordinate fit these three different experiments. So here we plot the coefficients of the model that we've learned in these three experiments. And we see again that they vary quite gradually. So it seems to be more or less consistent across these three examples. And here we actually want to understand is there anything that we can say about our model that actually agrees with some of the theoretical models that have been developed in the literature for, for the bellows of Jepotinsky reaction? And in fact, there is. So here I've plotted the phase plane dynamics on um, the first experimental example of the model that we've learned. And what we see is that we actually learn a stable limit cycle. And in fact, um, it has the correct cubic shape null cline in its second coordinate. So this type of a limit cycle and null cline appear very consistently across many of the two variable bells of Zhepotinsky models that have, been, that have been presented in the literature. So at least phenomenologically, it has the correct dynamical behavior. And the last example, we also tested this on the classical Lorenz attractor to show that we can also uh, use our approach for chaotic dynamics. So here what we did is we gave it two coordinates, the X and Y coordinates of this three-dimensional system. And in fact, using the same approach as above, we were able to exactly learn the correct equations for the Lorenz attractor. And in our paper, which will be coming out soon, we also show uh, in the appendix that you can just give the X coordinate of Lorenz without observing Y and Z. And you learn a model that is actually quite close to the Lorenz attractor. It's not equivalent, but um, we actually show that it is, it is very predictive and there is some reasoning for the type of equations that it's learned. So that's where I want to end for today. Essentially, we've shown that we've developed this optimization procedure, which allows us to stably fit uh, differential equation models to noisy partially observed data. We've shown it on um, this ground truth system of Fichinogumo and on these two experimental systems of the squid axon and the chemical reaction. And there's all sorts of interesting connections to learning higher order models and using them for model comparison. So that's where I want to end for today. Our archive link will hopefully be coming out quite soon. So yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, hi. This is Panos Tinis from Pacific Northwest National Lab. I actually have a couple of questions. Uh -huh. The first is about the sensitivity method. Mm -hmm. So uh, from what I remember, for sensitivity methods, the dimensionality, you get a matrix equation uh, not a matrix equation, yeah, right, that mm -hmm. one, yes. So, mm -hmm. because basically you linearize to get the sensitivity equation, you, these Jacobians will be of dimension P by P, right? Whatever is the dimensionality of P. Yes. So, yes. how many parameters do you actually have? Because this thing can become quite expensive That's right. quickly. That's right. Yeah. So, so actually, there's two there's two alternatives for sensitivity methods. You can either do forward sensitivities, which is what I wrote out here, mm -hmm. uh, which make you pay the price in terms of your parameter vector because right. the system becomes n times p dimensional. And for our applications, this was perfectly fine because we have on the order of 10 to 100 parameters uh, and and okay. can compute these Jacobians quite efficiently. Um, so it, it it wasn't really a problem for us at that scale. But if you have many parameters, like getting into several hundred or two thousand, then you can use the adjoint sensitivity methods, which don't the okay. number of parameters. Okay. And uh, the second question was, can you say a little bit more because about how do you guarantee stability? Because you mentioned yes. as a problem that, you know, X dot is mm -hmm. equal to F of XP loosely, right? If you try to use the L2 uh Mm -hmm. term in the objective function how how do you actually do better yeah. than that yeah so essentially the sensitivity method that i written out here it takes your original system and it appends to it this n times p system of mm -hmm. gradients right so actually every time that you're computing gradient of x1 with respect to p you're re-simulating your original differential equation 
with the current parameters that you're optimizing. So, right. so you know for a fact that you know, uh, every time you're computing gradients and you want to take one more gradient step, you're actually checking whether your simulated model fits the data or if it's diverged or, or done something else. I understand that, but still this is during training. It's yeah. not for the operational, let's say, phase where you actually use it to That's make right. predictions. Yeah. So, so, that, so, of course, um, you could try to... Um, yeah, so so really what I was saying is even during training, uh, checking that your model is uh, converging to your training data and, and, and not doing something else um, is something that is very nicely baked into this formulation of sensitivity. I agree, I agree, yes. Uh, but, yes. but of course, of course, uh, for testing outside of the region that you're simulating your model in or outside of the training data on some other test examples, um, no, that's not something that adjoint methods take care of, but that would be interesting to somehow try to incorporate. Okay. So, so there is no imposition of any kind of structure or stability by construction. No, no. There, there no, are definitely okay. papers that do this. Like there's a yeah. trap and paper that tries that, that, that focuses on this. What structure. was that? I didn't hear that. Uh, there's there's this paper called Trapping Cindy. Oh, okay. I believe they uh, assume a like a quadratic form on the right hand side of their dynamical system. Um, and and because of that, they're able to actually impose some constraints during optimization such that it stays bounded in some region when you simulate it. Oh, uh, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, um, this is Adar from Brown University, if I uh, may ask. Uh, uh -huh. Can you uh, go to slide number 15? I think it was uh, plots. Mm -hmm. um, no, before that, sorry. So I noticed like it, uh, yeah, this one. Um, in most of your plots, you have, for example, the the like there's a like the the, the green one on the bottom left has mm -hmm. like a green uh, shade or something like that. Is it like you're do, you're trying to do like interpolation and extrapolation? Uh, yeah, that that shade was just meant to say that's how far our training data went. But right. I'm, I'm not plotting any data in the green uh, region because we only have data on the first coordinate. Okay, so like you only have data on the first like hundred time steps yeah. or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a bit more than a hundred, like hundred and ten. Yeah, I see. Okay, that's uh, uh, and okay, that's cool. That's really nice. And I wanted to ask. Um, so, given that you're trying to find the coefficients that parameter that define the equation, mm -hmm. so you have some knowledge of how many parameters you have and like how many. Um, higher the derivatives you, you do, you showed you can chop some of them, but you are assuming some pattern, like uh, how many parameters do you have, how many interactions, how many multiplications, and you're just finding the coefficients, right? Yeah, we're, we're just finding the coefficients in front of them, cool. and we're assuming that, that uh, a lot of them are zero. Okay, okay, so uh, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, all right, okay. Thank you. Thanks for the clarifications and very, very nice talk. Thanks. Uh, yeah, please go ahead with your question. Yeah, thanks, George, for this talk. Um, I have a more general question. So um, um, a large but uh, important class of dynamical systems are Hamiltonian systems. Mm -hmm. So if, if you know in advance that they are Hamiltonian, can you exploit this structure? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I think that's a very interesting direction. I believe there are some works that have started doing this, um, where essentially, yeah, now you know exactly what the Hamiltonian dynamics looks like. So instead of trying to just learn the right-hand side as a sum of polynomials, you can actually say that the right-hand side is going to be a gradient of a Hamiltonian, um, where the Hamiltonian possibly also has some polynomial structure to it. Um, so then you would be optimizing the polynomial coefficients that appear in the Hamiltonian. Uh, mm -hmm. And you could definitely uh, use these kinds of approaches for that problem. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Do we have more questions for George? If not, uh, thank you, George, for tuning in today and for giving this wonderful presentation. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me.
With that, we come to an end for today's seminar. Uh, you may want to say something, George, if you want to. No, 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 no. That was that okay. was it. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, before we uh, leave today's uh, seminar uh, meeting, I would like to thank all of you for uh, promoting our channel. We just touched thousand subscribers, and thank you everyone for promoting this. And with that, we uh, end our seminar today. Have a great weekend ahead. Thank you.